This video is starting off in a different area from normal because I really need a lot more room to actually fit this in because it's quite a big unit. It's a sharp plasma cluster air conditioning or cleaning device and it has an air intake at either side and each of the air intakes has a little coarse filter uh, leading into the fan. So there's one of those on either side, one of those inlets, and then the outlet here has these clip-in plastic diverters that if you want the air to flow in this direction, you clip them in, point in this direction, or you can turn them around, or you can mix the air up a bit by just putting one in either way. But we're interested to see what's inside this. So initially I'll show you it running. I mean, it's not that exciting. I'll turn it on and you'll see that it's got one setting, low level setting, and you might hear a hissing noise. And then it's got the high setting. And it is powerful. The power of the fan is a significant factor here. Let's turn it off. Let's unplug it because I'm going to open it up. So it is now unplugged. And as part of the standard maintenance procedure on this, you lift these out and you change the plasma cluster module inside it. So let me pull off this little plastic clip. If you've never opened one of these before, after you've pulled these out, you pull off this little bridge piece here. And that reveals two thumb screws that you then unscrew. I wonder how many people uh, get these and then don't ever maintain them. Once you've done that, the cover slides off, revealing the air outlet here, and also the important bit, the plasma cluster module. This is a replaceable item. You just simply unplug it like this, and then you plug on a new module. Um, then it reassemble it. And this is the bit that's interesting, but before we go into taking this apart, Let's take a look at the rest of the circuitry in this. I have explored it in advance. Most of the base is that big fan. The electronic circuitry, the circuit board, is all very neat, incidentally. The construction is well up to Japanese standards. Uh, even if it is made in China, the design is Japanese. You lift off this cover over the electronics. Very neatly out. But another neat thing is the fact that the cover over it is lined entirely with a uh, mica sheet for fire protection. That's very good. So here's the circuit board in the base of it. Uh, let's take it to the bench. That's the best bet. We'll go to the normal bench and we'll take a closer look at this because then we can explore it in more detail. Back at the normal bench, other things worthy of note. Lots of connectors, lots of wiring looms and more mica on the back. They've got a slight misalignment of one of the punched holes that's not quite lined up with the pin. Uh, but lots of wiring looms and lots of safety interlocks. When you take the cover off this, it disconnects both the live and neutral and that all goes back through the circuit board. The circuit board itself, oh, I'm just going to lift this unit out of the way, it's big. And there's lots of little extra circuit boards just for button interfaces. Oh, I should mention before I just put that out of the way completely. You've got a few indicator lights in the front and the, uh, the off, medium and high airflow setting. But also on the back, you've got right down here, you've got a little recess that when it says that the plasma cluster has expired, you put a new one in, but you have to insert something into that. Uh, have I got something thin enough to, to poke in there? I'll poke this screw in. There's a little clicky button in there. So that's worth mentioning. If you have one of these and you change the plasma cluster module, then you click that button to reactivate it. So this unit starts off with a fairly textbook design. Let me show you this. It, it's very Japanese. It's very complex. It seems overly complex, but everything has a function. So it starts off the power supply. We've got the incoming supply that is then branched out to two circuits, which go through the safety switch that kills power to the whole unit. We've got a fuse, we've got a metal oxide resistor uh, for the uh, suppressing transients class X2 capacitor. We've got a com mode suppressed show, another class X2 capacitor, a bridge rectifier, a NTC inrush limiter, and then we've got a big fat capacitor for the power supply. I thought initially this was a discharge resistor. It looks kind of, it looks kind of like it's been getting hot. For that reason, I'm just going to nudge it very slightly away from the case of the capacitor because uh, hot things against capacitors aren't good. It turns out though, it's not what I thought it was—that it was some discharge resistor for the capacitor. Then there's a switch mode module driving this transformer, and interestingly, in the back of the circuit board, uh, is this going to brighten up? We tad. 
On the back of the circuit board, it actually shows all the windings of, of the transformer, and there's a lot of uh, descriptive information in the back, including the fact it puts out a 5-volt supply and a 40-volt supply. So the module has... It drives the transformer directly, but things like the that resistor there and these capacitors and this diode are actually the snubber network that is designed to uh, protect the transistor inside this module. And likewise, the auxiliary winding on the switch mode power supply, where is the auxiliary winding? Down here, the auxiliary winding down here uh, has the diode and capacitor to actually power this module. That's the bootstrap circuit is off board. It's strange. It almost alludes that this is an old unit. That, you know, it's an older unit. What, uh, hold on. Is there a date code in the chip? The chip, let's try less magnification. 0927. Could that be from 2009? Could this be about 10 years old, this unit? It was bought as brand new, but it's maybe, I get the feeling, given the price it was being sold at, that it's old stock. Um, the output then goes to uh, goes through these two flat pack diodes and charges these capacitors, but the feedback goes to that module, so it's also got the opto-isolated feedback on it, I think. Let me just double check that. Yes, it does. It's going to this cluster of pins at this end of the module here. Other things worthy of note about this, the fan, initially I thought the fan was going to be multi-phase fan with a transistor pair winding because the colour code was red, yellow, blue, black and I thought that's the old three-phase uh, colour so maybe it is and there's three transistors in the vicinity of it but they're not to do with that. The fan connection has a the ground rail and it's got the 14 volt rail going to it but it's going through a thermal fuse that if it, uh, the fan overheats in some way if that burns out it's going to kill power to the fan and it's also potentially going to kill power to the uh, the plasma cluster module the plasma cluster module is switched by these eight transistors they appear to be some sort of darlington-ish style array uh, where one transistor then buffers up to the next one but this doesn't actually draw that much current as you'll see because we're going to take it to bits there's a microcontroller that's running the whole show and fundamentally so it breaks down into power supply with an uh, isolation that isn't super dramatic it's okay it's acceptable um, but ultimately it's in a double insulated appliance it seems quite safety conscious it's designed been designed sensibly so yeah, the power supply comes across like that, and then it's just this massive, neat resistor arrays and things like that, with transistors to drive LEDs or switch the modules. That's about it. So now, let's get into this, because this is the bit that's really interesting, and this is also what I might say is a bit of a controversial thing, because Sharp make this amazing claim about this unit, about how it creates, is it, positive hydrogen molecules and negative oxygen molecules and then they're surrounded by water creating little plasma clusters and it goes to great uh, pains in certain adverts and promotional things in the website well not the website but in the internet in general to say that it doesn't produce much ozone I am not convinced about this because to be honest I have a sneaky feeling and I think you will you'll see when I get this out so let's pop this up, and when we take this cover off, we see one, two, three, four modules, and a little wiring loom that branches out to them. It's just a marshalling, there's no active electronics on board other than what's in these modules. I thought initially, because they claim it produces positive and negative ions simultaneously, and it's the positively charged, as I say, the positively charged hydrogen, negatively charged oxygen, and they bind onto bacteria and things in the air, and then they pull out hydrogen and they turn into water, and it can moisturise your skin, and, and it can make removes odours. It's the claims made for these units are ridiculous. And this is a really major selling product. This is a huge product in Japan and potentially India. It seems like a really big deal. But uh, the modules inside it, I thought they were negative and positive because I wired some LEDs to this with resistors 
to monitor the power to these modules. And it was driving them in diagonal pairs. And initially, I don't know if you heard it earlier on when I powered it up, it was making that ee noise. So that was driving these little high frequency modules. And initially it starts driving them at that pace. But then after a while it stops. And then it drives these ones for a while. And then it stops. And then it drives these ones for a while. And then it goes back into the alternating. I'm not sure why. Um, there is sensing going on as well. I think the circuit board is sensing the current through these in the sense it, there's no, it's not controlling these other than just turn them on. I think it's just monitoring to see if they're there and if they've malfunctioned and turn the power off or, or report it as a faulty unit if they do malfunction. Um, there's something else that I should have mentioned. Uh, I'll cover that afterwards. I shall show you pictures of that afterwards. But anyway, it turns out that these units which all come out individually and it's really nice cases everything is nice about this they've all got the same serial number danger high voltage A138AK or should I say unit number 9616BC they've all got the same number and all of them have a positive end and a negative end um, suggesting uh, that, well, you can't just... Uh, initially, I thought it was alternating because you can't... I wouldn't have thought you could have an ionizer that creates positive and negative ions simultaneously because they just merge again. But uh, this thing has a needle that produces positive and negative, but it's also got a little metal surround around that. And that's where it gets a bit weird. So let me pause momentarily and show you what is inside these. So what's inside each of the modules? Well, I took one to bits, you may notice that. Um, if you take a look at the module itself, the front cover comes off to reveal the, a circuit board that has been placed in the front and then it's been potted in with resin. And interestingly, at the back, there's a high voltage transformer, that's this little transformer here, and then there's an open cavity, but they've sealed the circuit board in. So this bit is hollow inside, round some of the circuitry, this bit's potted, and then this bit's potted. It's quite complex construction. Really complex construction, in fact. The front cover hides metal rings with a sharp needle in the middle of each. I can show you what that looks like up close because I did take a picture. It looks like that. I've tilted this up at an angle so you can see the metal rings with these sharp pins protruding out and they are what the corona discharge occurs at the end because there is a corona discharge uh, that'll be the plasma bit um, and that's what imparts the charge onto the air as well but what's odd is that one is at positive potential and one is at negative potential and the circuitry is a lot simpler than you might think the circuit board itself was refreshingly retro very retro. It's no surface mount components at all. It's got a little transformer. It's got a traditional little transistor. Uh, ordinary resistors, these little things are just like a miniature version of a sort of 1N4148 diode. Um, and then it's got a small capacitor, which is this one, that is charged up. And I'll, I'll show you the schematic for this. Quite a complex construction to take to bits. I mean, it's simple enough inside, but it all had to be kind of depotted. So let's tame this down just a little tad because it is a little bit ferocious. And we'll go through the circuitry. It's a 12 volt supply and reassuringly, there is a polarity protection diode. Let's zoom down on this because that is kind of, that makes a bit more sense, doesn't it? So it's got a polarity protection diode, and then unusually it's got two little resistors in series, ma making up an odd value, 63 ohms. That's also coupled up with the resistors on the circuit board that were leading out to those modules. There's a, it's, it's a very strange circuit, fine-tuned values. There's a little yellow transformer, and it runs with a 12-volt primary effectively, but it's got a feedback winding here, and it's got the high-voltage secondary. So this transistor... Um, basically oscillates it, it uh, current starts flowing through the primary uh, due to biasing from this resistor and as soon as that happens uh, the feedback induces current into the um, winding and uh, that turns the transistor on harder until it reaches a saturation point and then it sort of it turns off and then it has the opposite effect it sort of collapses I'm not sure why the secondary is attached to the the base of this transistor 
Patreon supporters may be getting deja vu. When I was initially reverse engineering this a while ago, um, I, I just showed them a little sort of preview video of what I was doing and got their input because I thought some of this circuitry was very odd. But the uh, secondary winding then charges this capacitor here. That's the little red capacitor. 47 nanofarad um, and it charges it up until it reaches a threshold voltage of a SIDAC, I'm guessing. It could, couldn't really be much else. Where is the SIDAC? The SIDAC is somewhere in there. It's a SIDAC-y type thing. Quite an odd, quite a big one. Um, and uh, that dumps the current through the primary of this transformer, this potted one, this high voltage one, which has the uh, heavy primary wrapped around the core, which is really common for ionizers and things like that. But then it's got a completely isolated secondary uh, wound in multiple sections along the bobbin. It just, uh, I couldn't really get in much closer than this. Uh, I used uh, solvent, I used acetone to do most of the dissolving, so it's not left it as clear as it could be. Although I think the plastic is not particularly clear anyway. Uh, but it has multiple sections, and then that has two connections coming out, one here in the vicinity of the primary, but not connected to it, and the one at the secondary. Unfortunately, while drowning this open, I did actually cut the winding, so I couldn't test that. Um, however, oh wait, no, did I not test it by, yes I did, 490 ohms. I tested it by popping the lid off a module, because I knew what the connections were. Hold on, let's do that right now. Let's bring the meter in, put it through there. I reckon I connected to there and there. Yeah, 490 ohms, roughly. Okay. And then it goes a really strange direction. There is no, effectively no reference to the ground. I mean, that is a double insulated appliance, and maybe this is a good thing, because if you have an ionizer and it's putting out a single polarity, and this is where these USB ionizers are a terrible idea. If you have an isolated power supply like this one is, with no connection back to ground, or even back from the low voltage side where the ionizers are powered from, to the uh, the main side, then if there is a huge potential difference created in the air looking for a way to ground, then you'll actually get a high potential voltage across the transformer in these power supplies. So that, I'm guessing they're just trying to avoid that. But what they do, on this circuit board is one diode there and one diode there with a midpoint connecting to the output of the one end of the transformer. Another end of the transformer is connected to these two metal rings. And the two metal rings in front of the needles encouraging corona discharge, and I suppose ultimately attracting the, the charge. There might even be an effect of a sort of capacitive multiplier thing just going with ambient capacitance. But what you end up with is a corona discharge on the tips of the needles, and they make a distinct buzzing, hissing noise at the same time. Um, one is at positive potential, and one half wave of that uh, when it that capacitor is discharged through it, and the other one's at negative, and then... Uh, yeah, that is it, ultimately. And one As the coil is pulsed, it will current will flow in the positive, and then as the field collapses again, it'll be the negative, or vice versa. Very strange. I've not come across that before. So these modules, um, they go to great pains in the advertising to make it out that they've got this special thing that they're basically speaking. Well, let's see what they describe it as. I, I shall read their promotional literature. All uh, right, okay. You ready for this? It's going to be a bit sort of hyped up. Column, what's a cluster? The most familiar example of a cluster is a cluster of grapes. When water molecules surround ions that are generated by plasma discharge, the result looks much like a cluster of grapes. That's why we call the technology Plasma Cluster. It's also why the Plasma Cluster logo looks like a cluster of grapes. So they're saying a water molecule goes in and an oxygen molecule goes in here. The discharge electrode, the positive one, uh, splits apart and you end up with a positive hydrogen ion. Now, hydrogen at, uh, atoms are, they carry a positive charge at a sort of chemistry level. And then it says water molecules surround the ions. I suppose, technically speaking, that's true, that there is moisture in the air. But why would they surround the ion? And then the uh, negative one, it says, it um, puts a charge on the oxygen 
of the negative charge, and oxygen does by default have that negative charge, apparently. I'm not a chemist, That's this is Thunderfoot territory. But um, it says the water molecules go on, and then their advertising basically says, it's, it's really stretched, I'm just not convinced by it, that uh, when it attaches onto viruses and things like that, that it pulls out a hydrogen molecule atom and then it forms water again and then it just dissipates into the air as water. And it sounds so lovely and healthy, but they don't mention the ozone. I say they don't mention the ozone. The ozone is actually quite important. Uh, something else I didn't mention about this. Look at this. It's lovely. Um, it's just the design is absolutely beautiful. It's, it's very retro. It's almost like they said, if it works, don't fix it. It's, it's a really nice design. Well engineered. Maybe a bit over-engineered in that circuit board, but look at the connector. They've moulded the matching part of the connector into the case, so it just clicks on. That's nice. So let me uh, put the cover back in front of this one. I shall clip this back on. And one of the tests they frequently show on their uh, adverts, which is generally lots of excitable Japanese student -y type people, um, running around in white boiler suits and doing scientific experiments which involve putting uh, things that have been tainted with strong odours into a plastic container with these units, the modules out of these, or the actual whole units. And if I get a suitable container here, here we go, we shall do the test. I'll actually let you hear things as well. So I'm going to sniff this container. The container has no smell. It's been well ventilated. There's no plastic smell or anything. Let's get the power supply on. And let's hook the power supply just like they do in their tests. Little mini avalanche of components happening behind me. So I'll connect this up. And I shall turn this on. Now, can you hear this? It makes that buzzing noise. Hmm. So I put it into this container, just like they do in their tests, and I cover it. And I just leave it for a while. And it's worth mentioning another test they did was uh, they do show these same modules being put in chambers and they're, they're actually showing it kills the influenza virus because they do the sort of, they pass air through the chamber with an injection of a mist of the virus droplets. And then it comes out the other end and then they put it on this sort of Petri dish to actually culture it and see if they grow. But um, in this short time that I've said that, I can smell ozone. That is ultimately, I think that's the real effect that this is having. I think that the sharp plasma cluster is ultimately an ozone generator in disguise, but not in a bad way. One of the tests they showed was also a, a piece of bread being put in two plastic containers. Uh, one of these dangled into it, and the one that this was dangling into, no mould grew, grew in the bread. Again, that could be down to ozone. I, it's so odd. Their descriptions are complex, and it's all full of colourful graphics. I really get the feeling that they're trying to avoid saying that this is a controlled level ozone generator. I mean, Sharp are probably going to hate me for saying stuff like that. But the thing is that in natural nature, natural nature as opposed to unnatural nature, there is a natural level of ozone. And that level of ozone is not present in people's houses because there's no air circulation in the house. So, And the materials in the house, all the synthetic materials, they're very capable of absor absorbing, you know, deactivating the ozone by what ozone does. It oxidizes. It gets rid of the smells and, and bacteria and stuff like that and uh, mold spores. So I think what they're doing, the concept of this is really, and they say they, they're rated for different room sizes. I think they're aiming to produce an equivalent level of ozone in the air to outdoor, natural outdoor air, something like 0 0.04 parts per million, which is a natural level. And by using that massively powerful fan, it's not loud, it's just really powerful. Um, and... Controlling the output from these units, they're effectively um, creating just that trace level of ozone, an ambient level of ozone that is enough to freshen the air up and create the outdoor air equivalence of ozone presence. However, 
maybe there is something else going on. Maybe there is the fact that the positive and negative is a bit weird unless they are using that as a clever final stage multiplier or just to split it between two needles reliably because uh, otherwise with a standard uh, multi uh, ionizer type circuit you'd only have one needle and that I suppose this makes it more efficient as well. Um, but I, I don't really know. Maybe there is something happens with the positive ions and negative ions. Maybe they do have some combined effect. But certainly if I put an electrode, well, I could test that right now. I could show you. Let's power it up again. And do a little test. If I bring the meter in and set it to volts, let's set it to one volt. We'll power that uh, corona discharge unit up. Is it buzzing? He said, stuffing his finger at the end of it. Okay, it is. If I say, for instance, stuff that in there, and I hold it in front of this electrode, you'll get a slight negative voltage. Oh, hold on, I'll bring the meter in so you can see that. And if I put it in front of this electrode, you'll get a positive voltage. So it is putting out positive and negative charge. It's very strange. I'm perplexed. I'm flummoxed. I am. I, I don't know if this. I can't prove otherwise that it isn't just an ozone generator. But I've not got a problem with the fact that you know it does put, produce that trace ozone, and stirs it well into the air. If anything, that's worth getting just for that effect. But there we go. It's a complexly. It's really well engineered. It's well made. It's it's very retro in a way. I think modern ones are evolving to use different circuitry. Um, but probably have the same ultimate function. But uh, this one is strange. It's It's got uh, the through-hole components plus a little smattering of surface mount as well. Strange. But uh, really well built. The quality is superb. But I'll let you chime in and tell me what you think of this. Oh, I almost missed one thing. How is the time going? I've got, I've got time before it... Uh, I've got plenty of time before it rolls on to the next section of video. That's fine. There is another component in here. And it's this. I thought I had another... I do have another picture. It's underneath it. Foolish of you, Clive. Uh, let's zoom out because this is quite big. Above the plasma cluster module, where is that uh, unit? Under this cover here... Hold on, I'll show you. That's the best bet, isn't it? Then, then there can be no doubt. Uh, I would show you if I could find the screwdriver used to open that. It's held together by these... Chunky self-tapping screws. Very odd. With really fat cheese heads with a, a hex recess. So if I take this cover off, aside from the fact they actually have... I'm wondering if they're using this to monitor the output and test the heads. Because if I take this cover off, there is the little connector that goes into the plasma cluster unit. The actual That mates into this. And there are, uh, there should be about eight connections. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, there are eight connections. The blue only indicates the, the sort of pin one of the connector. Um, then we get this. And this has a, a little flap, a little flap, which reveals the circuitry that is down here. And on the front is an antenna. And this is just where the output of this is with the air blowing past it. This is directly above it. Um, and I reckon that it's some monitoring device. Because the circuitry on it, on one side it's got the gold antenna. And this is basically a charge collection plate with one at the site opposite polarity. It's, a really, it's really strange. Uh, and this is a dual op amp, but only one op amp in it is used. And it's basically getting power down to power the op amp circuitry. And then it's got a signal back. And if we look at the circuitry on that one, it's only using one of the two op amps. Let's zoom down in this. It's got that antenna, and that antenna is pulled by a high value resistor. I couldn't measure it because it was in the circuit. Surface mount, I didn't want to take it out. Uh, but it's a high value uh, resistor pulling that up to the positive rail with a capacitor just to provide sort of slight stability. So it's looking for a constant DC uh, variation on it. 10k resistor to the input of the op amp. It's got a 10k resistor back for the gain setting. So I'm guessing, and then the 10k resistor, it's all 10k resistors out. But then the outer antenna surrounding that is coupled to the zero volt rail 
via a 10k resistor in the output. Is this going to oscillate in some way? And by detecting the charge, the, the level of charge, it's going to... I don't know. This is very strange bit of circuitry. But it does look like it's designed to detect the charge going onto this plate. Unfortunately, because everything is completely locked inside, one, I'd have to run bunches of wires out to actually test that. But uh, I'm guessing then, really, it's just it's to monitor the charge output. And that I wonder if that they're somehow regulating the ozone generation, or if they're just switching through those modules and checking that they're all working uh, by looking for the change of charge. Um, particularly the fact that we're alternating between pairs. You know, they were diagonally... <laughs> Uh, these two would come on then, these two, and they were just alternating. I don't know if at some point they actually switch around them. Again, that would require hot wiring and getting LEDs out and a cluster of LEDs on the outside. But I've only ever seen when I was testing, I had a bunch of LEDs connect at one point. I only saw it just uh, doing the diagonal swapping, but sometimes at different speeds. But there we go. That's, it's an odd thing. It's a strange thing. It just leaves me wondering... Is it doing what they claim it's doing, or is it just an ambient level ozone generator and coarse air filter? You do get other versions that uh, do uh, have much more complex filters in them, air filters, but they also then have this uh, sort of plasma cluster unit that puts this sort of discharge into the air. Very odd, but um, very interesting. Lots of fun taking to bits and really quite complex. But there we go. Uh, let me know what you think. Um, do you think it's actually doing what they say or do you think it's just an ozone generator in disguise trying to stay under the radar of all the hysterical people that say ozone causes cancer in the same way that coffee causes cancer if you drink enough of it. Uh, low level ozone is fine and it, like, the same applies to most things. But there we go. Interesting. Lots of fun taking that to part, to apart. And the quality, as I say, is just absolutely superb.